Investors seem to be reallocating their portfolios. Outflows, growth, uh, thematic tech, inflows, value, energy, dividend, inflation theme, commodities. Uh, give us a sense of what you're seeing. You're sort of watching the entire ETF universe. Yeah, I think definitely there's an inflation narrative playing throughout the market. And you're seeing it in ETF flows. Um, you know, on the thematic side of things, flows have stayed have plateaued. There, we haven't seen a lot of inflows, but outflows have not been crazy yet. So it's good to see that investors are staying the course there. But really, broader, broadly speaking, I look at the sector data, and you can see big shifts out of technology, comm services, into energy, into financials. You know, what's unique about that, specifically, if you look at the combination of all sector and industry, U.S. sector and industry ETF data, is over $600 billion in those ETFs. And right now, energy is the most overweight relative to the S&P 500, with 11% of total sector and industry ETF being in energy. So you can really see that rotation playing out, not just in net flows, but how it relates to the broader market and allocations. Yeah. Well, there's no surprise about the inflows in energy with oil at $90, a seven-year high. That, that sort of makes some sense. Now, Jeremy, Wisdom Tree has several products that fit into this reallocation strategy. Uh, you're very strong in dividend ETFs. You've got a great lineup there, uh, starting with the Quality Dividend Growth Fund, DGRW there. Now, you're looking for companies that are growing earnings as well as with some growth characteristics. Tell us about this fund right now. Well, the, yeah, that's around a $7 billion ETF. It's been the flagship for how do you find companies that can grow dividends into the future? And a lot of companies uh, just look backwards to say, have you grown your dividend for the last 20 years or 10 years or even five years now? We were the first firm back in 2013 saying, can you look forward using a combination of quality metrics, return on equity, return on assets? I call those your Warren Buffett quality screens. Buffett says, I like high return on equity companies that don't use a lot of debt. And that's what we packaged in that screen, combined with earnings growth expectations from a dividend, which is a more value type universe. Uh, it's a very interesting combination today. Uh, it's been one of the best performers in the large blend category the last three months because of that defensive rotation. Um, it, it's sort of top 2% of all large blend funds because it's of that, that dividend screen, but good quality earnings yeah. that are supporting that dividend. Yeah, I, I would note this is that classic situation where you're growing, not necessarily having a big dividend. So Apple and Microsoft don't necessarily have large dividends, but they are growing the dividend, which is why they, they show up here, along with the traditional, you know, Procter & Gamble type and Johnson & Johnson names. So, um, Jeremy, keeping on this, commodity ETFs, we're also seeing inflows in. You have an enhanced commodity strategy fund that's out there as well, symbol GCC, that's a mix of agriculture, precious metal, livestock, industrials, uh, in metals in general. Tell us about that, too. Yeah, that's, uh, if you look at, we have 75 ETFs uh, in the U.S. That's the top performing to start 2022, up 7% this morning. And what, what it tells you is, you know, there's, there is this fear of inflation. Uh, rates are heading up from the Fed. What do you do for a standard 60-40 portfolio allocation? Commodities and inflation-sensitive places are one of those diversifiers. We still think inflation's here with us. And so what do you do if you think stocks uh, can be hit by rising inflation and, and, and a and rising bond rate? That's, the bonds don't provide as much diversification as they used to. Inflation-sensitive assets like commodities are, are a good portfolio hedge, and we've taken a diversified approach. Uh, an interesting thing is, historically, it costs you a lot to roll futures. It costs you like 5% a year for two and a half decades because the futures curve. That's changed where you're now getting paid 4 to 5% in yeah. these diversified commodity baskets. Well, that's because things have changed, Mike. You know, it seems like you can't lose with the commodities uh, at the moment here. So the futures curves in commodities, a lot of them are in backwardation right now. The front month prices are higher than future prices uh, farther out. Um, so what's that telling us? What's the implication for owning a commodity ETF? Well, it's significantly positive is the short answer, but you know, I, I think to Jeremy's point, we've seen broad-based commodity ETFs that include GCC and others go from 10 billion in AUM a year ago to 20 billion today, and no sign of slowing down from a flows perspective. But obviously, all of these strategies have unique um, structures, and it's something to really note when you talk about backwardation and contango. You know, the environment is much friendly for that those future role strategies right now. And it's a tailwind 
um, in, an, in an area of the market that's already hot. So I think we'll see continued flows into this space and, you know, rightfully so, in, in, in our opinion, ETF action. Yeah. You know, it seems like, Christian, any ETF uh, with the title inflation, that's all you got to do is put inflation in the world, in the word. It's got inflows right now. Uh, you just launched an inflation fighter ETF. The symbol is IWIN. And again, this is a, this is a very interesting mix. I'm curious about how you put this together. Stocks, gold, Bitcoin, commodities. Uh, I, I know the stated goal is not just to provide a capital appreciation, but to do it in inflation-adjusted terms. Explain that to us. And how did you get this curious mix together? Yeah, so if you look at just the plain commodity ETFs, there's some benefits in owning that. And certainly there are a lot of people who will want to own these futures-based ETFs. What we wanted to do is create kind of a hybrid approach where you have uh, inflation-sensitive stocks that are exposed to commodities. Uh, you know, there isn't a land, uh, you know, futures contract out there, but you can buy land development uh, companies. You can buy commodity REITs that have some of the benefits of, of REITs and land ownership, but also the exposure to commodities. You can buy asset miners, miners, gold miners, copper miners, et cetera. We want to combine those with exposure to commodity futures, uh, corn and ag other agriculture, energy, gold, and even Bitcoin. So uh, we wanted to create a diversified basket where you could uh, own a percentage of your portfolio to fight against inflation and hedge, not necessarily take the full bet on commodities and backwardation, backwardation and contango, but at the same time, not ignore uh, the equity space as well, because many of those companies are quite sensitive to inflation if you get that selection right. Yeah. You know, it, Jeremy, there's, there's a lot of interest in, I don't know what you would call them, a specialty products that you sort of mix and match assets that used to be considered fairly exotic. They're not so much anymore. You have the Wisdom Tree Efficient Core. Uh, ETF, NTXS, that's a, an actively managed portfolio of equities and treasury futures contract uh, leveraged to, I think it's a 60-40 portfolio. Again, a little bit on the exotic side, but it's getting interest. What's the idea behind this product? Yeah, this, this fund is approaching a billion dollars. Uh, we launched two versions, international and emerging markets, which are NTSI and NTSE. Uh, that have also scaled very quickly. So there's a, probably about a billion and a half, billion point one in, in the combined family. And the idea is getting more for your money. So we get ca capital efficient is what efficient core stands for, that for every dollar, you really get a dollar fifty of exposure of 90 cents of equities and, and 60 cents of bond futures. And when you think about the challenges for inflation sensitive assets like commodities, like gold, uh, where do you create room in them in portfolios? And you know, we've heard a lot for the diversifiers that they had below par expected returns for the last decade. People couldn't sell bonds for them. They didn't want to give up the equity upside. And so these funds are designed so that you can put two thirds of your capital and get that same 60-40. And then you have a third of your capital to either keeping cash for spending or to buy commodities or gold or any other diversifier like managed futures that might hedge some of what's going on in, in the market risk. Do you, Jeremy, do you have problems explaining this to people? I mean, are you, you selling most of these funds to uh, institutional people or people who are professional money managers? I mean, the average retail investor is going to have a little bit of a hard time getting their head around some of these specialty products. I wonder if the, selling them is, is a problem or whether it's really just professionals that are, are, are putting it in portfolios. You know what, Bob, what's fascinating about this fund is this was a product of the people born on Twitter, and it was actually driven by retail, I think. I think the early investors were retail, that people give the retail some more credit, that they are able to understand these things and how it fits in portfolios. And then, and, and actually later, after retail uh, was some of the early investors, then you saw some large RIAs, some other institutions. It is a well-known strategy in the RIA world. Uh, institutional world. And so I think the that, that professional investor came on after retail, but uh, I, I don't think it's it's that hard to understand. I think people did get the, the use case, even though it's a little bit uh, more sophisticated than your traditional standard 60-40 allocation. Yeah. And if you don't want fixed rate bonds and nobody seems to want them, Jeremy, there's, there's a floating rate bonds. Uh, and and yes. you've got a floating rate treasury fund, uh, USFR, I believe it is, US Frank Robert. Uh, yes. and, and what's what's in this one here? So this is a, I think this is the fixed income fund for the next two years. 
uh, when you know when you think about there was a lot of uncertainty over what's happening in stock world. The Fed has communicated they're on a path to hiking rates. During the last rate hike cycle, the floating rate treasury was the highest yielding treasury by the end of the cycle. Our view is that's going to happen again. Uh, and so USFR is the way to play the Fed rate hikes. The, the, the U.S. floating rate treasury auction this week was already up 29 basis points ahead of the Fed funds target. Those floating rate treasuries are already reflecting the Fed hikes. Uh, and so USFR is really the best way to play the Fed. And what do they own in terms of floating rate treasuries? Explain, make sure people understand what's going on here when you buy them. Sure. The, a floating rate treasury has the shortest duration of any treasury security. The rates reset every week with the latest auctions. And so it's just a U.S. Treasury security. I mean, it is it is a government issued security. They issued them in 2014. It was the first new government security after tips were issued in 97. And so it's just a standard government bond. But instead of a fixed rate, it's a floating rate that gets reset every week. So it's a pretty standard uh, government security. Yeah. Now, Christian, you have one of my favorite titles for an ETF. You have the Black Swan ETF. Uh, the symbol is SWAN, S-W-A-N, and you have a, a Q version, a Q SWAN. Uh, the, but the SWAN tracks an index, uh, speaking of specialty products, long-dated options, as I recall, on an S&P 500 ETF. Uh, and you also have U.S. Treasuries with an average of a 10-year maturity. So how did this work? You get some equity exposure through options, but you also have some downside risk. That's the theory, right? That's right. It's kind of the classic black swan barbell approach where you have a risk off asset like treasuries and then you have a risk on asset like the S&P or NASDAQ. And what this allows you to do is get about anywhere from 50 to 70 percent of the return of the relative relative index, whether that's the NASDAQ or the S&P, but have considerable always on hedged exposure um, to the market. So a quick example would be uh, the decline that we saw in COVID, where the S&P was off over 30 percent in you know, several days. Uh, Black Swan was down just 9 percent during that time. And we've seen more interest in this just because of the geopolitical tension. Certainly, people aren't making tactical calls really on Treasury exposure here. But we know when market uh, volatility increases, when there is a geopolitical event, Investors go risk off. They focus on U.S. Treasuries. Treasuries then have a negative correlation to the equity market can be an important part of a hedged portfolio exposure should we see disruptive events or black swan events.